we get to the uh, even more difficult uh, part of the discussion now. Um, the uh, technology is challenging enough, but uh, addressing market failures and uh, people's irrational behavior is uh, certainly for those of us who come from the technology end even more uh, challenging. So can I ask uh, Volker Schindler from uh, Technical University of Berlin to kick us off in our discussion of, of talking about uh, how we design effective government policies to deal with these, these market failures. Thank you very much. I'm here in charge of the, uh, uh, the uh, board of academic advisors of federal, federal ministers. So what I'm telling you is not just what, what, what I'm thinking, but, but what this board was thinking, but with some um, special um, well, highlights which where I'm responsible for. Well, I, you, know, you all know the situation. In Europe, traffic contrib contributes about a quarter to the uh, total CO2 emissions, and the most prominent em emitters right now are passenger cars. The, in, in Germany, the uh, rate of growth of emissions of pas passenger cars is nearly zero. It's even declining. But a lot of growth is in uh, road haulage and in air traffic and also in, in, in seagoing vessels. The seagoing vessels also have a, a problem with, with toxic emissions. We have already talked about that a little bit. Um, I'm now focusing on uh, passenger cars because this is the most prominent, prominent uh, part of the CO2 emission um, volume in, in, uh, in, in traffic in, in Germany and in Europe. Well, energy use in road vehicles obviously causes some undesirable desirable, desirable side effects. We, I've listed them here. If we can uh, slide later, you, we can go into some, some, some more details. And you see uh, they are quite uh, different in, um, in their um, impact. Uh, many of them have already been solved, as you can see here in these slides. So you can see that all these uh, toxic or other harmful ingredients of exhaust emissions have been reduced to a tolerable level. And uh, what is also interesting in our context is this takes about 15 years, 15 to 20 years, depending on what you define exactly. So ca we can quite be quite confident that uh, we can solve other problems also. Can we also be confident to, to solve the CO2 problem in, with the same speed? Well, I think this will be a little bit different business because CO2 is the final product of the combustion of uh, hydrocarbons and we cannot get rid of that. There is no after treatment for that. So we can on, only do uh, some other things, and uh, we have a lot. Uh, we have heard a lot of that. Uh, I've listed it here in a, in a, in a, in a um, while well, I've tried to do it in a systematic way. We can, we could use less road transport. This would obviously have a lot of impact on uh, lifestyles, on land use, on division of labor, on logistics, and so on. This is not what we are talking about here today. Uh, we could use more efficient use of vehicles. We could use the same vehicles, use them more efficiently. Driver training, driver assistance system could be some uh, clues for that. We could use more efficient vehicles. We have a lot of technologies which could be brought into the market in principle, <coughs> but all of them have their side effects, have add quite a lot of costs to the, to, to the vehicles. We could use smaller and less consuming vehicles. This would have a lot of impact on, on lifestyles and, uh, and certainly also on uh, topics like safety in mixed traffic and uh, things like that. We could use other fuels. We could get rid of the fossil carbon in our fuels, if possible. Uh, and all of that would have to be embedded in a policy which makes that possible. 
this was the wrong button. <laughs> I'm now talking about more efficient vehicles uh, and or the usage of, of smaller vehicles. Where are the the um, the, uh, the physical limitations? How far can we we go? There, there are some 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 uh, things which cannot be. Um, uh, overcome like rolling resistance, aerodynamic drag, uh, um, uh, acceleration, which has to be which, which has to be overcome uh, by a, by a force, and climbing resistance is also uh, a necessary ingredient. We also have consumption of, auxil of auxiliaries in uh, in vehicles, and we have the efficiency of onboard energy conversion systems. So there is a lot of possibilities to tune all these ingredients for a better um, fuel efficiency. But for a given technical means, for a single means, say improvement of rolling resistance for, for example, uh, the increase in mileage is in the, in the is, is some percent, two, three, if it is a big potential it's, it's, it's five percent. So the the single breakthrough technology which uh, which makes things better if we apply it is not available and costs become really a serious issue because all low hanging fruits already, already have been reaped uh, this is why in at least in europe fuel prices are high traditionally so it wa it, it always was uh, interesting to invest into um, um, economic uh, vehicles more in Europe than in other parts of the world. So, where are the limits? I have uh, here some 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 vehicles. Um, what has been told us about the the CO2 emissions per kilometer? And in the case of the bus, below there per occupied seating uh, place, you see. There seems to be a limit in the, in the, in the region of, say, 100 gram uh, per kilometer. Uh, to, to, to go down to even to, to 30 has been demonstrated as possibly, possible, but whether this is really a vehicle which, which could be sold on the marketplace still has to be proven. Um, if we contrast that to politics, then we come to this picture. Above you, f you find these uh, three dotted lines. The lower red one shows the um, average CO2 emission of the fleet, which was rigid as, uh, reg reg registered uh, in that uh, year, respective year. The, uh, the, 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 the top one uh, is uh, the same for the gasoline cars, and the um, line in, the, uh, in between is the, the average. And uh, you see the trend. It's, there is a, 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 a trend uh, sh going down. Uh, it, there is an intrinsic um, um, technical development going on in the in the market under the pressure of the existing um, economic conditions. If we now want to come down to the targets, which I have indicated in the in the picture. Uh, as, a, as it points, uh, the 130 gram, for example, at uh, 2012, or the 130 grams at uh, also at 2012, or even the 95 uh, grams at 2020 or 25, which have been uh, discussed uh, in, in the public, then you see uh, a, mis uh, a gross mismatch. In, in my opinion, it's simply impossible to, to, to come to uh, these uh, figures without changing very much the um, consumer habits. Just by improving existing cars, it's simply impossible. Um, one means to, to come into this direction is to, uh, to um, uh, define... Um, uh, fuel consumption for a car, and this seems to be an objective uh, measure, but it is not by no means. It, it, it is uh, only possible to, to define such a, such a fuel consumption by defining um, a, a test cycle. 
and uh, the test cycles. I've, this, this picture shows deviations from this test cycle for uh, cars which have been tested in, in, uh, and, and, and their reports have been published in, in, in Germany in, in, in the recent, uh, recent times. And you see that all of them are above the one-to-one uh, -one line and even many of them are above the line plus 40 percent. So um, <coughs> ECE consumption does not really have much to do with uh, real consumption. Uh, making the things even worse, uh, engineers tend to um, take this, the, the, the method how to um, define a mileage uh, and uh, the, uh, as, a, as, an, as, an, as, a, as an objective against which they are optimizing their system. So this tends that things which can help to improve the, uh, the, the mileage, the figure of the mileage, uh, will be organized in a way that the official mileage is low, not thinking about the real mileage. Well, if we, if we sum up, we have some intermediate result. It is possible, obviously, to increase mileage by a considerable amount. This requires quite expensive technologies or a switch to smaller cars, and timing has to be agreed realistically. What else can be done? We could go to other energy sources or other sources for carbon or for, for energy, the material form of the energy. If you go that, through that in more detail, you see um, gasoline and diesel are really good fuels. There are some drawbacks. Is it possible to retain their advantages to, to avoid their problems? Yes. This is a, a refinery in an in a, in a extremely simplified form. You could make it much more complicated. You could feed him lots of energy sources. But I think this could be an, an option. All the other things which uh, feed in, uh, say, photo photovoltaics uh, or which, uh, which uh, result into um, hydrogen are, in my opinion, not really uh, useful or, or, or come, come at a price which is, which is too high. So an obvious choice could be biomass, but this will become quite expensive. And uh, perhaps we will have to restructure huge areas. This then comes then to the question, what really can we do? And uh, I think we are able in principle, I skip this, we, we are able in principle to, uh, to um, introduce much less consuming vehicles. Yes, in principle, we should increase prices for that. But this would result in an uneconomical usage of, of, of resources because it is not done everywhere in the, in the, in the uh, energy economy. <clears throat> so taxes on all usage of fossil carbons should be raised to the same level. Well, coming to such an uh, quite, quite utopical uh, objective, um, I would ask policymakers to aim at an equal level of, of taxation on the long run and to create some sort of a coalition between car makers, car users and policymakers uh, with the idea to substitute more expensive but less consuming cars for later usage of, of petrol or diesel. And this is, um, is, a, is a problem which has to be solved in a, in the, in the, uh, in, in, in a, in a greater context because it cannot be done simply by the, by the car companies, cannot be done simply by the, uh, by the users. It, we have to create uh, a bigger picture for that. Thank you.
Oh, sorry, that was a formal action. Thank you very much. Can we pass on quickly? Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak here. Let me see whether technology is a limiting factor in this uh, respect. I'm afraid it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, back, back, please. Oh, well, that, that's my fault. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, just to very briefly introduce myself and the organization I, I represent today, uh, um, and I represent t and &E, Transport and Environment. We are a federation of uh, 51 environmental NGOs that campaign on uh, more sustainable transport, uh, and we are based in, in Brussels, and our objective is to green uh, Europe's uh, transport policy. Um, just to kick off, which which is a kind of the frame, the context that we operate, uh, that we operate in, uh, in today. Um, first of all, it hasn't been said that often today, but uh, um, the climate change science uh, gets scarier almost by the month, I would think. The gap between emissions trends on the one hand, which are really accelerating, and the knowledge and what we need to achieve uh, by 2020, 30, 50 is widening uh, by the day, so the urgency is, is, is dramatic. Um, second is transport is uh, very bad at, at uh, reducing emissions. Uh, if transport emissions had been stable, uh, since 1990, uh, Europe would have a very easy job meeting the Kyoto targets. Today, um, it's not a very easy uh, job. Um, th third, some people seem to think that the oil issue will solve itself. Oil will run out and everything will be beautiful afterwards. Well, uh, we, normal oil certainly runs out, uh, but um, I'm afraid that we are facing a future of dear and dirty oil instead. And the two are linked. If oil is not dear, it doesn't make sense to make oil from tar sands and coal to liquids. So dear and dirty, that's the future for oil. Very problematic. Um, others uh, seem to think if we put transport in the emissions trading system, we'll all be fine. Uh, if you attend meetings on the emissions trading system, we are very much witnessing a situation uh, that uh, going very far in ambitions level in the European emissions trading system uh, will be uh, economically damaging for some sensitive sectors in that system. Uh, the system boundaries, how effective it will be, will essentially be determined by the most sensitive sectors uh, in the system, um, most exposed to, uh, to international competition. And transport, households, buildings uh, are really quite domestic sectors. Uh, there's no way you can replace European transport with Chinese transport, uh, for example. Uh, so there's no carbon leakage issue in transport. There is in other sectors. We should be very careful uh, mixing those. Um, biofuels, uh, another potentially easy way out. Many doubts have arisen, particularly over the carbon impacts of indirect land use, uh, which threaten to change biofuels into usually a good idea, into usually a bad idea. Um, uh, the, the carbon impact of indirect land use, and electricity and hydrogen uh, are still far away. So that's uh, a, a quite a bleak picture, particularly for the future of hydrocarbons, I would say. There's really not a great prospect for sustainable hydrocarbons uh, over the next decade. This uh, reinforces the point that we believe that integration of transport and ETS might seem uh, an, a nice way forward, but we, we believe it's a bad idea. Uh, for the environment, it doesn't matter where you cut CO2. Uh, for the economy, it matters a great deal whether you cut CO2 in strongly exposed sectors, uh, exposed to international competition, or that you do it in more domestic sectors like transport, like households, like buildings. Uh, economically, it's much more damaging uh, to be tough on carbon in exposed sectors than it is in domestic sectors. And before we uh, consider the idea of integrating transport in a system for exposed sectors, we really need to think twice, three, four, five times. Um, very short words on biofuels as well. There's a very odd situation now going on in European uh, policy. There's two strongly competing policy ideas. One idea is the old-fashioned idea of fixing a quantity target for biofuels, uh, saying by 2020, 10% of energy supplied in transport needs to, be, needs to be biofuels. Now, that tells the market, supply as many liters as, of biofuel as possible at the lowest, uh, lowest possible cost. 
uh, and inevitably that leads to friction with sustainability. We're trying to solve that through regulation and uh, frankly uh, what's coming out now is, is quite a mess. So we need to shift towards a more modern approach. Uh, fortunately, uh, two uh, important regions in the world are shifting to that more modern approach. One of them is Europe. Uh, Europe proposed a low carbon fuel standard a bit more than a year ago, which says uh, it doesn't matter which technology you use, uh, as long as you cut life cycle carbon from your fuels, you're fine. Set the life cycle carbon for greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and the best biofuels will prevail. And last but not least, you send a strong signal that non-conventional oil, petrol and diesel, is not welcome in Europe and California is doing exactly the same. We believe that's the way forward. Technology neutrality, uh, carbon-based fuel policy. Um, a couple of general words on, uh, on car efficiency standards. We believe, contrary to what some economists think, that they are a very efficient uh, policy tool. The discount rate of consumers is very high. That means they do not consider future fuel savings uh, very much in their purchase decision. It's a very good reason for policy intervention. It's possibly very effective. We are certainly talking about double digits uh, of emission reduction. Other measures are very difficult to achieve uh, such percentages with other, uh, other measures. One often overlooked issue is that car efficiency standards are very fair. The benefits end up uh, primarily at consumers who are not able uh, or capable to buy a new car. They don't, do not pay much for the technology, they get the fuel saving benefits. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's a measure to help citizens rather than to make them pay uh, the bill for uh, climate policy. They are competition neutral, uh, and don't have negative side effects and they create lots of added value in the supply chain. Um, there's more of, of value added in, in cars. Um, one issue that we should certainly consider as well, if, if we sell a car today, you basically sign a check of 130 barrels of oil imports over its lifetime. At today's oil prices, that comes down to 11,000 euros of uh, uh, money that just flows outside of the European economy without any, any tangible uh, benefit. Uh, the economics of improving cars are uh, very, very good with oil prices that we see uh, today. Um, and one issue that is never considered in any impact assessment is that um, if we cut oil use by making our cars better, we can get a grip on oil prices. History has shown that uh, in the 80s, when global oil demand dropped, uh, oil prices dropped very, very sharply, and we were basically having 20 years of cheap oil as a result of those cuts in the 80s. Uh, I think we are, we are on the eve of another cycle like this, that we are going to, I hope we will seriously cut oil demand and uh, that we will get the prices back in the bottle. Begging OPEC to pump more oil is not a constructive answer to today's crisis. We think uh, cutting uh, own oil use is, is slightly more constructive. Uh, then the question, what's technically feasible? Um, many assessments all, only look at technology, what technology can do, low carbon technology, that's all fine, that's all reasonable. But we believe in order to achieve the drastic carbon cuts uh, that we need, we cannot just look at low carbon technology, we also need to look at low carbon car specification. So really changing uh, you know, car designs. And these are just a couple of examples how far that can potentially take you. The world record in CO2 emissions is currently 0.8 grams of CO2. I'm not suggesting this car is marketable tomorrow, but it just shows you that you can think in different orders of magnitude if you're prepared to change the way you think about cars. Uh, but it does imply a huge paradigm shift. Uh, we need to think different about car size. We definitely need to think different about car weight. Um, performance is probably the most important paradigm shift that needs to take place. Uh, cars are currently sold often on the basis of power. But they need to be sold on the basis of economy. Fuel economy needs to be an asset. And uh, that will not be easy for an industry that has thrived on the slogan, there's no substitute for cubic inches. Uh, there is a substitute for cubic inches, and admitting that uh, you have been wrong for 100 years is not easy, but it needs to, uh, it needs to happen, uh, I believe. Um, 
Then uh, a few words about compliance costs. They have been discussed a lot. Uh, although I'm a mechanical engineer myself, I wouldn't claim to hold the truth uh, in, the, in this matter. But as an observer of uh, what happens and an, uh, as an observer of uh, research in this field, uh, what you see is that ex post cost realizations in the market are much better than ex ante estimates as a rule. And the literature points to that uh, after regulation has been introduced, the real costs are two to ten times lower than was estimated before. And then the, the obvious question is, now why is that? There's two reasons, I think, technical reasons. Uh, the car industry has thousands of very, very clever engineers who are together a lot more cleverer than uh, usually two or three consultants who draw up uh, a nice report. They are also clever, but they are just you know, less numerous. So it's inevitable that engineers Thousands of car engineers have more clever ideas. Secondly, uh, there's a strategic reason behind this. Uh, before introduction of a regulation, all the incentives for the industry are to pump up the cost figures. And what you essentially see, Paul Niebenhuis can attest to that, is that it's very difficult, for example, to get cost figures from suppliers. Uh, they tend to be very, very cautious about communicating what they have got and what it will cost. The only people that will tell you what things will cost are the OEMs. And they, of course, have a, an interest in increasing the cost figures until the regulation is in place, then the incentive is to cut them. So these are some observations on, on cost. Then on the European proposal, um, we think it's a very flexible proposal. We don't have a lot of uh, problems with that. Um, it, but it is, it is a very flexible proposal. Fleet averaging, you can even pool with other car makers. It's attribute-based, giving more room for uh, bigger cars. But we do have a problem with the lack of ambition. We need to realize that 130 by 2012 is only 7% less than 140 by 2008 and four years later. Uh, and 140 by 2008 is what the industry promised to achieve by itself. Uh, I would like to say a few words as well on the fact that the regulation is weight-based uh, because we believe that is a very bad idea. If you see this graph where the energy of a car goes to, weight plays a very important role. Um, Cutting weight. Cutting weight is therefore very, very critical. Uh, and uh, what the EU regulation will in fact do is punish car makers who cut weight of their cars. Uh, if, you, um, uh, if you make cars in 2012 with an average weight of 1,214 kilos, this is quite an arbitrary figure, then your company standard uh, uh, will be um, 120, 27 grams. If you cut that down by 100 kilos, your company standard will become 122 grams. So you get almost five grams penalty for doing the right thing. Um, and if your competitors do the, the wrong thing, your own target gets, gets even tougher. So it's completely counterproductive and it really is a discouragement for cars of 400 kilos, for example, that we saw as concept cars uh, today. Um, also, a lot of talk today about diesel, that we need to cut down on diesel. If we have weight-based standards, diesel cars are heavier, and weight-based standards give diesel cars an extra credit because they are heavier. A very unwelcome development. Uh, this is how the U.S. does it. This is an area where Europe can learn from the U.S. Footprint-based standards uh, and not a straight line, uh, uh, quite a smart curve that avoids all too drastic outcomes for very small cars and very uh, large cars. I think this is a very balanced approach uh, for future, future EU regulation. So, summary, the easy way out. ETS and biofuel are really not easy, and they are not even a way out, we believe. Um, if you think that making cars better is difficult, then you know, look at the alternatives. We think they are even more difficult. Uh, the benefits of car regulation are, as a rule, underestimated and the costs are overestimated. I think that's a nice one for, for debate. And uh, uh, standards or, or basing car standards on the car's weight is a big, big mistake that really discourages car makers from doing the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Well, we've had um, two very contrasting uh, presentations in terms of uh, one, uh, one, th uh, one about... Uh, the lack of ambition in 130 grams per kilometer by 2012 and uh, Volker suggesting that he thinks that it's uh, an unachievable target. I think, I hope I don't misrepresent you. But I think while we have that, that point about weight kind of in our minds, 
I would actually like, again, and sorry to keep the spotlight on our car industry uh, colleagues, but I, I would like to hear your views about whether, whether you think weight is going to drive the wrong behaviour and footprint would be better for the, uh, for the European uh, regulation. Well, theoretically, uh, your, your point is uh, not, not wrong. Uh, but I would uh, recommend not to start this discussion now. We have found some compromise on, on at least the formula, of how, we, how we evaluate uh, fuel efficiency, and we should stick to it rather than starting a new discussion on the basics. Uh, from what I observe in our industry, none of us has interest to increase weight of cars. There are other, other factors that, that rather force us to, to lower cars, and like what I've shown you from our group, the, Audi's intention to introduce aluminum and cut, cut weight has a long tradition and has not been stimulated by the CO2 discussion of last year. So I don't think this really helps uh, greenhouse gas emissions if you start this discussion now. Yeah, I completely agree. And although we have shown this car with 420 grams, we also still think that a weight-based approach is the right one for car industry. Joss, do you want to come back on that? Um, I see the point that, that kicking up this debate right now uh, it potentially you know, disturbs the whole situation. It would be very unfortunate if uh, it would be abused in that matter. But um, if we could get an agreement that uh, for the next review for the post-2012 targets, that in principle uh, there's an ambition to move to footprint that at least uh, would tell the industry that really there is no future for heavy cars and there is a bright future for lightweighting. Because inevitably this, this law is going to punish lightweighting and you it's um, impossible that you are you are happy. Uh, you can be happy with with that, but maybe for the next phase. I think we have to be honest that in these discussions, nobody's mentioned market, the market, and and the market appeal, and therefore the sales volume. And I think we have to be honest that certainly uh, size reductions do have a market impact. And you can't compel people to buy smaller vehicles. I just think we need to acknowledge that this is a buried, it's the elephant in the room in terms of some of our language. It's something we don't want to talk about, but it's real and it's there. Can I just say, isn't uh, advertising the elephant in the room? Because I, I must admit, car advertising, I think, is a, a, a very powerful generator of, of image and aspiration. And, uh, and uh, I think that's a switch that the industry has. Gary Kendall, do you want to make an intervention? Um, I was... One small point about you can't force people to buy smaller cars. You probably a few years ago you couldn't. You, you would have said you can't force people to stop smoking in cafes in Paris. But you know we, we, we regulate things, and, and in fact you see behaviour change, and everybody's better off for it. Thank you. Paul. Yeah, I think the elephant in the room is really the fact that many manufacturers today offer cars that are quite a few cars that are below 130 grams per kilometer, quite, some of them quite credible cars. I mean, the Prius is the obvious example, but you can buy a small Volvo, a small BMW even, that, that goes beyond that limit. There are a number of manufacturers that in fact do comply with the, the, the voluntary agreement that's not an elephant in the room. So it's not that the whole industry says we can't do it. In fact, a lot of the industry is doing it. Uh, which brings me to uh, Volker Schindler's point about low-hanging low fruit having been plucked already. I think there's quite a lot of low-hanging fruit still unpicked because so far the driver has not been CO2 reduction. It has been performance increase. If despite that primary driver, as reflected in advertising, we still have a lot of cars, credible cars out there that, that are well below the 130 grams, then I think perhaps there is a lot more potential in the way yours suggests to, to, to bring things down quite a lot by, by 2012. Well, I'm... I think there are credible cars which 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 go below uh, go to 120 or something like that, but what I'm doubting is that the the majority of people now is willing to buy them in numbers that uh, would lead to a to an average in the fleet, which which is uh, demanded. So, I think. Um, Every 
a lifestyle is a is a very complicated um, it's a very complicated uh, thing. Some people find it more uh, interesting to drive a car, possibly rarely, which is quite which is quite heavy and has a high consumption. But the same person lives in a flat with. 50 square meters, which is only heated to 19 degrees in, in winter times. Another person does not accept that, wants his 120 square meter flat heated to 23 degrees. And uh, he is now able to pay for that out of his budget. If we l let him do what he wants to decide, but uh, manage that, that by having the same CO2 prices for each application of, of fossil energy, and then I, I think the, um, the, the overall benefit would be optimized. Sounds like you're advocating personal carbon allowances here. Yeah, I think Joss has a no, point to you. I have a bit of a problem with this, uh, this reasoning because you suggest, I mean, all car laws, uh, fuel efficiency laws in the world, and Europe is not an exception, give more leeway to bigger or heavier cars than to, than, than to small ones. So you suggest that the only transition uh, that is feasible is a massive move to smaller cars. And this is not, uh, you know, what, this is not what this law is about. It's attribute-based. Each car has to, uh, has to be improved, whether that be a big... Mercedes S has to maybe improve by 25% and a small uh, Fiat Punto maybe by 10, but they all have to improve and it's, it has very little to do with lifestyle regulation. This comparison with a big and a small flat really doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's about offering the best product within each category of cars uh, that is conceivable. John, a quick point and then I want to open it to the floor. To resolve or to, to move this kind of discussion to a better plane, we need to put together future sales mixes that will, for example, double fuel economy. We were asked to do that by Environmental Defense, an environmental organization in the United States. To double the fuel economy of the total sales mix is very demanding, as, as, um, as uh, Volker said. And it takes more than half the vehicles to be hybrids. You need the order of a 30% weight reduction, and you need to have only modest improvements in performance. You have to put all of that technology into fuel consumption. So that's three very big changes that have to happen together to double the fuel, fuel economy. Quantify it if these are your objectives. You can do it. It takes effort, but quantify it. What does it take? Thank you for that. Um, are there contributions people would like to make from the floor? Oh, while people are thinking, Gary has got another. Yeah, uh, sorry, I thought because I thought I was going to have an opportunity to comment on. Anyway, so here we go. <laughs> um, so I think there's from a from a policy point of view, you can distill it, distill what we need to do down into three areas. One is um, reduce demand. One is decarbonize energy, and, and and the third is improve energy efficiency. And I think everything you can distill into into those three buckets. And since we're not talking about reducing demand here, maybe that's for for another workshop. Um, I wanted to say something about decarbonizing energy and about improving efficiency. So on decarbonizing energy, the the, the big problem that we have in the in the automotive transport sector specifically is that that, that we're 95% dependent on oil. In fact, it's more accurate to say we're 95% dependent on liquid hydrocarbon fuels um, because as the, as the oil concentrates into, into um, less accessible um, regions, both geologically and, and geographically, um, what that does is obviously it drives this, um, this supply-demand pinch, the oil price goes up, um, and then we have this financial incentive to invest in the unconventional oils, as, as Jos mentioned with the, the tar sands um, and the coal to liquids. And to just give you a couple of numbers, um, by 2015, Shell, who's the, the I think the largest um, retailer of, of um, transport fuels in the world, um, will will be producing about 15% of their of their um, production will be from unconventional sources. 
Um, that's by 2015, which means it's kind of like yesterday in, in oil industry terms. Um, and all of the oil majors are in, in the tar sands in Alberta because that's where there's a stable investment climate and, and with oil prices where they are today, it makes economic sense. China's target for coal to liquids, which is, has double the carbon footprint of conventional fuel, is three times higher than their, than their target for biofuels. So, and when car manufacturers talk about um, vehicles running on synthetic fuels, I think what they have in mind is, is sustainable, renewable synthetic fuels. But I think what energy companies have in mind is something else. Um, and it includes coal to liquids and gas to liquids, which are just shocking um, wastes of, of energy, and, and we, we don't want to be going there. Um, in short, the carbon intensity of liquid fuels is very, very likely to increase over the coming years, and I don't think this has been factored into all of these projections, um, or certainly not to the extent that it's going to happen. Um, now, what, what, this is all driven by the need by energy security, and energy security comes through diversification primarily. Um, and within the liquid hydrocarbon space, there's not very many places that you can diversify. And in fact, where you have to diversify is, tends to be worse than where you start, because you get the easy oil first, right? Um, but if you look at the power sector, it's just inherently a more secure sector. Um, it's maximally diversified for primary energy sources, and it includes all of the physical renewable energy resources from which you will never manufacture liquid hydrocarbon fuels. You'll never get gasoline or diesel from wind or from solar or from geothermal or from tidal or from wave energy. Um, and we will see the proportion of those technologies increase in the power sector. So over time, liquids are going to get worse. Over time, electrons are going to get cleaner. Right, so that's about decarbonizing energy. And it should be for, for policymakers to ensure that energy suppliers are responsible for reducing the carbon content of the energy that they supply. Now to the final thing, to improving the efficiency of the vehicles. Um, manufacturers of energy-consuming devices, whether they're televisions, refrigerators, light bulbs, or automobiles, um, that devices that consume energy should be held responsible for improving the efficiency of those appliances. Um, and and what, that, what does that mean? It's increasing the efficiency with which their devices convert kilowatt hours into the energy service of interest. In this case, the energy service of interest is kilometers. Um, and so what, what vehicle manufacturers should be doing is, um, is improving the efficiency of vehicles expressed in an energy efficiency indicator such as kilowatt hours per kilometer or megajoules per kilometer. So, so coming back to there was an earlier point that, that really the right measure is liters per 100 kilometers. Well, it's not actually the right measure because that's, that's a proxy of energy efficiency, and it's a proxy that's only valid when you're, when you're consuming liters. And what's, what's a liter of electricity? What does it look like? I don't know. I haven't done the calculation, but I think if you can convert um, diesel and gasoline into kilowatt hours, but it's quite difficult to convert kilowatt hours of electricity into liters. So I think we need to start, if we're going to improve the efficiency of cars, then we need to start measuring the efficiency of cars. And we're not doing that yet in policy terms. And that's very important. Industries frequently telling us that we, that we have to um, construct policies which are technology neutral. And at the moment, grams, per, grams of CO2 per kilometer is technology specific. Liters per 100 kilometers is technology specific. Miles per gallon is technology specific. Kilowatt hours per kilometer is technology neutral. And, 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 and we're writing policies to influence the future automotive fleet, not to represent the 800 million vehicles that are on the road today. Thank you. I think there's an important point there about, um, uh, about treating different fuel sources consistently, particularly as we move to, to hybrids and things. I think it's a, a quite a challenge. We had three contributions over here. I'd like to take them one after the other, please. And can we have your name and affiliation first? Well, thank you very much. Uh, John Stevens, and I'm representing the Institute for Environmental, European Environmental Policies uh, in London and Brussels. I've been trying to work out whether this discussion authorizes us to go away feeling optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, much of the first part of the discussion really lifts the spirits because we can see from the different speakers just how much can be done through different forms of technology and so forth. But I think we're beginning to see the warnings coming together. And I'll just quickly tick off the three that have struck me, although there's no surprise in them. I mean, the first along the line, I think, uh, was the, the future of the electric vehicle or the hybrid vehicle. 
It is such an exciting prospect, and yet, as we've been reminded by Professor Hayward, really, it does depend on where the clean energy comes from, whether the, whether the electricity produced uh, actually is of a, of, a, of a clean variety. What about biofuels? We're discovering, I think, confirmation that there's an important niche but I really think it's true that a quantitative target of an ambitious degree is likely to push up the supply irrespective of where the biofuels come from. And it is painfully difficult to establish just what the secondary effects are. Creditation schemes and so forth can be tried, but they really cannot reach everywhere. And finally, I think this discussion uh, has shown us that when we talk about the regulation of vehicles to establish a, a carbon standard in the vehicle, well, a lot must be done by that route. But we've just touched upon the rather technical sounding question of whether an allowance should be made for the weight of the vehicle. It does sound an obscure technical point, but it's going to drive some of our policy discussions in the near future. I think we have to acknowledge that if compromises are made for the weight of vehicles, they may be made for reasons of economic or commercial or social policy, but they're certainly moving in the wrong direction from those who wish to see climate change reductions achieved. In each of these directions, therefore, we need to know exactly what we're doing and be very cautious that the measures we adopt don't, in fact, fall apart and break up in our hands. Thank you very much. Can I ask speakers to keep their points as focused and short as possible, please? Thank you. My name is Romain Hubia. I'm coming from the UNEC uh, in Geneva, from the United Nations Economic uh, Commission for Europe. And uh, as Mr. Schindler put uh, the ECE regulation on, on the spot, I wanted to add uh, some additional uh, comments on that. Uh, he mentioned the EC regulation on fuel consumption and uh, it is true that, uh, well, I am happy that he mentioned it because it is already a test cycle, so a test cycle for the, for the measurement of the fuel consumption or CO2 emission is, is, is existing. It's not repres representing very good the, the real traffic conditions, but it is existing, but it is also not uh, performance oriented, there are not limit values included. So that only for information, but for historical reasons, this test cycle uh, was established based on the, on the emission test cycle for pollutants, and CO2 is not a pollutant, uh, it's not yet considered as a pollutant, and that's the reason why this test cycle was used to uh, create this regulation for fuel consumption, and fuel consumption was in the past, as, you, as we know, not that big uh, issue. Uh, the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, who is establishing uh, these um, regulations, uh, they, they, the experts are very well aware about these uh, test cycles, that they are not uh, reflecting very well the, the, the real traffic, and they started to, to reconsider all the test cycles for all categories of vehicles uh, since years now, and uh, the um, priority was set on motorcycle and uh, truck emission test cycle. This test cycle were concluded one year ago. Uh, WP29 established them as global technical regulations under 1998 agreement. It's a, gr a global agreement. And uh, WP29 is at the present time discussing the limit values to be included to, des to these test cycles for trucks and uh, motorcycles. And, uh, Next week, WP29 or the Working Party uh, for Pollution and Energy will start to discuss the new task cycle for light vehicles too. And in the first step, uh, it will be uh, discussing first the a roadmap. This will be established in a two years time. And then it will take another three, four years at least to set up a new test cycle for light vehicles so that we can say that in about 2015 we can have such a new test cycle for light vehicles, including the consumption of uh, fuel or the CO2 emission that will also be included in, in this t test cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a useful point of information and I think something that uh, it sounds as if we we, we need as quickly as you can develop it, really. We, we had a contribution from over here, I think. Please, can you hear me? Yes. 
Uh, my name is Tomas Vorisek. I'm coming from, from Seven, the Energy Efficiency Center based in Prague, Czech Republic. And I have a question for all the participants and speakers. We had a lot uh, about the technology developments and the future. Uh, but what about uh, market leadership and personal, uh, let's say, approach? Uh, so I have never seen a politician who would drive a car uh, which would be very, very energy efficient. The same may be said about uh, the car make, uh, ma makers and uh, the ma their management boards. So I would like to ask uh, all the uh, speakers what car they drive today and whether it is already uh, below 130 kilometers, uh, uh, let's say, zero to per kilometer. Thank you. Well, I'm, I haven't, we haven't got time to go around them just at the moment, but I'm going to be very smug because I can honestly tell you I don't have a car. <laughs> but at that point, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to, we're going to have to move on to the, the, the final discussions. And so I'm going to ask uh, Patrick Oliver from Michelin to, uh, to kick us off on talking about the way forward for policy. And I think we've already touched on some of this. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to try to get the... Here it is. Here it is. Okay. Should I wait for the first slide to appear? Should I initiate it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to share just a few messages with you. And the first idea I would like to share is uh, with the three uh, pictures on, uh, on the top, which is to say, let's have a look at Asia. Because that is where a lot of things are going to happen. Uh, the trend we're observing in Japan in Western Europe, in the US, is a global trend of markets going to plateau and then somehow going down. And uh, the major part of the growth is coming from Asia. And in Asia, there are some interesting things. I think that the nano is an interesting event. Second picture is, is about China with a, an electrified two-wheel. Uh, third picture comes also from China with huge, uh, huge buses going hybrid and then electric with batteries and, uh, and fuel cells. And, and then some other considerations with uh, this picture of a multi-fuel engine, which I think is an interesting concept in terms of development and possible uh, extension of the world. The AQ was already mentioned by, by, uh, by Stefan. It's a, it's a lightweight, urban, real vehicle. Hmm? And it's interesting. It's a, it's a thought to uh, what is coming on. Because the world of tomorrow, the one that we're talking for 2050, is an urban world. And that's where the market is going to be. We have to make sure we address the urban way of motoring. And, and the last picture is to make a reference to um, an event that we launched 10 years ago, Challenge Bibandum. I was personally involved in that because already 10 years ago, it was not very difficult to foresee that we would be running into the problems we are talking about today. And that the, uh, the point would come to policymakers. And for policymakers to make the job, that is to say to make policies, they need to be well informed, um, not by lobbyists, but by people who can give them the right material. So we set up this event in, in 1998 to invite policymakers and to let them test by themselves the best technologies which were offered by the manufacturers of the whole world. Come and test, come and share, and make your own, your, your own ideas on this, uh, on this idea. And it's very interesting. We will come to some of the conclusions. I'm sorry. If I were to, uh, to send four messages today to uh, the policy makers, this is what I would uh, tell them. We strongly believe, we are among those who believe that we need to do everything we can to reach the global objective of 50% less CO2 by 2050. We might run into strong problems if we don't do it. So if we are to do it, then road transport must and can play a leadership role in attaining this objective. And procrastination, that is, differing action, not acting now, would be dramatic not only for society at large, but for the whole automotive industry. Because what we will see is that a reduction in the way people will be allowed to move. Because at one point in time, if we really want to do something with climate change, we will have to do something with carbon. And transport will be, you know, uh, one of the primary targets. So let's be prepared for it and let's be um, proactive. Second message is reducing energy consumption of cars by 50% is feasible with existing state-of-the-art technologies. 
I'm not specifying the object, the, uh, the timeline. I'm simply saying we don't have to think about fancy technologies to be able to reduce by 50%. This is the conclusion. This is the primary conclusion, the event we held in Paris in 2006. It has been strongly confirmed by the 120 experts we had in Shanghai this past November. It is feasible. And when I say let's go for such an objective by 2020, I'm not irrealistic. I know for sure that fleets cannot go to that level at that objective. But by 2020, if we really want to, we can have a significant start you know, on the market of cars being capable of providing some kind of an alternative offer to the customers of today. Because what we really want to do is to make sure that in parallel with the day-to-day -day improvement that we're observing with a reduction of CO2, grams of CO2 per kilometer, at the same time we also introduce some one quantum leaps, you know, downward. So it is feasible. And this is not what I'm saying, but this is really the message from Challenge Rebandum. The third element, and we talked about that, is that electric vehicles can be made technically and economically viable today, particularly in a rapidly urbanizing environment. I'm insisting, in a rapidly urbanizing environment. It is time for road transport to stop depending solely on oil. And we talked about prices and so forth. Let's make a quick calculation together. Okay, because I think it's important to have orders of magnitude. When you take an electric vehicle, and I will show you some prototypes we, we have made, uh, you take basically 10 kilowatt hour. That's to your point, 10 kilowatt hour. If you design your car properly, lightweight of course, uh, you can run basically 100 kilometers. Okay? It's more on the 12 to 15 sometime, but it's, you know, uh, we have prototypes. And, and basically, when you look at the production of kilowatt hour in the world, it goes from anywhere you know, between 20 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour up to 900, 950. So there is a whole range where basically you say, okay, let's imagine for a while that you can get 100 grams of CO2, uh, gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Then basically, you take a car at around 10 grams of CO2 per kilometer. And I'll show you some examples. So it's impo important to have that. Talking about cost, because we have not mentioned the cost, I think that the market value that we can take today for batteries, lithium batteries, is around $1.5 per watt hour. It means basically 5,000 US dollars per 100 kilometer, rough order of magnitude. Okay, so we're not talking costs which are out of proportion with what we know. And I'm ready to share all this information with uh, all of you, of course. The fourth message is that <clears throat> it is clear, I think, and that was mentioned by uh, uh, some of the speakers this morning, that market forces today are, of course, evolving. But the magnitude of the challenges we have to overcome cannot be met by market forces alone. It seems to be clear that the quantum changes we have to introduce have got to be promoted by some interesting regulations, and then we can really trust our engineers to come to the solutions. And based on what we've seen coming from all the car manufacturers in the world, we know that solutions are there and engineers can meet, can raise against the, um, the, the, the challenges. Okay, second, you know, second element I would like to, to, to mention as we have thought is that we know that road mobility as it is today is not sustainable. But let's make sure that we do not concentrate solely on greenhouse gas. I think we have six issues that we need to keep in mind all the time. That is greenhouse gas, transport costs, oil dependency, which is an issue in itself, aspects of security and safety, urban pollution and congestion. Any solution that we should be promoting has got to take all these six, um, I think, issues into consideration. Now, why do we consume so much energy? Of course, we have to overcome resistances. We have already mentioned that, and it is very clear that weight is, is something that we have to, 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 um, you know, to, um, to deal with. But also because in urban conditions in particular, let's recognize that engine efficiency is not that good. Engine efficiency 
in average, is about 30%. In urban conditions, it's down to 20, sometimes 5%, while an electric engine is about 90%. Let's keep that in mind. It's important. Now, as I mentioned to you, the good news is that, and somebody asked the question of should we leave optimistic or pessimistic, I'm optimistic. I think that we can meet the challenges. It is possible to reduce vehicle energy consumption, whatever energy it is, by 50%. It is possible to reduce CO2 emissions by more than 50%. Um, <clears throat> and as food of thought, I simply would like to share with you examples which happened in, in, the, in the past months. 70, 71 grams CO2 per kilometer on the Shanghai roads, normal conditions, with a Logan. A Logan is not a car which is renowned for its aerodynamics or any specific. It's a case which is interesting because this car was specifically designed to start with a regular car, optimized with tires, with some aerodynamic aspects and so forth, minor things. 71 grams of CO2 on the Shire Road. The other car is one of the prototypes we developed and we participate in the last Monte Carlo rally. Less than 30 grams of CO2 per kilometer. I'm talking about the rally, full speed, full acceleration. Okay? It's interesting to have these orders of magnitude. In more civil conditions, what can this car do? And once again, we're not a manufacturer, we're a supplier, and we're simply here for the sake of making things, you know, um, debatable. But based on the orders of magnitude that I gave you, and now I'm talking real figures here, with this car, which is a four-seater, curb weight is 850 kilograms, acceleration from 0 to 100 kilometer 10 seconds, so it's a real uh, car. It, you can see that depending on how you get electricity, this is the complete range you would get, for instance, in Europe, going from Sweden, where basically a lot of hydroelectricity is, um, is uh, produced, France, where we have a mix, Germany, where there is a mix with a lot of thermal plants also, and Greece, which is primarily, primarily thermal, uh, thermal plants. Interesting to see. Now, you might say then an electric uh, type situation is good in some countries. It's not really good in others. But then I will go to, you know, the next slide, which is what we do practice every day in Switzerland. What does it show? It shows that we have already gone electric. And we can go with battery vehicles or fuel cell vehicles. The interesting thing is that with 55 square meters of photovoltaic panels bought from the market, you know, in 2004, we're not talking fancy technology once again. We get electricity, we electrolyze water, get oxygen and hydrogen, use that in the uh, fuel cell. We drive 20,000 kilometers per year. So it shows that basically we have already reached, technology has reached a situation where it is feasible to you know, consider that if you have your own house, on one side of the roof, you deal with your driving requirements. On the other side of the roof, you deal with your housing requirements. This is proven technology. So what I simply want to introduce here is this notion that We've talked extensively about um, the hybrid concept, plug-in um, um, uh, vehicles. Um, we have kind of eliminated the notion of pure electric vehicles or postponing it to a much longer future with fuel cells. I completely disagree. Completely disagree. And I would like to mention to you a statement by the State Council of China who wants to have a situation where by 2020, 50% of the new cars, I'm not talking fleets, I'm talking the new cars, should be either electric or hybrid. But the 11th plan of China calls for smaller, lighter vehicles with a great emphasis on, on electricity. And that's important to, to realize that because as we have to develop progress that we've seen, and which is, I think, extremely valuable in, uh, in, in our countries, we need to keep an eye on these technologies which are particularly well suited for urban environment. And the urban environment is where we're going to live tomorrow. Um, let us ride together towards sustainable mobility and I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick.
I'd just like immediately to ask uh, Ian Hodgson to come in with, uh, with his uh, European Commission hat on to talk a bit more about policy and costs. Uh, thank you. Well, if I could, I would actually like to stand back a little bit before going into that because um, obviously when we're developing policy in these areas, uh, one needs to have some sort of vision of where you're going to. And of course, uh, we've heard quite a lot of talk about greenhouse gas. The, the Commission has put forward its vision, uh, a two degree, a limit of, of climate change to two degree, which then when you uh, translate that into what that means in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations, and then you uh, lead on to look at what that means in terms of, uh, of actual emissions um, per capita, you're looking at something like a 60 to 80 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions per capita for developed countries by 2050. And just for the sake of argument, if you project forward current transport emissions, around about 2035, 2040, these two lines cross. And so transport emissions would be responsible for all of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions if nothing changed. And I think that is a starting point where you then realize that you do have to do something. Um, and there is an important need to have a sort of shared vision of, of how you can respond to that challenge. And uh, Gary said it perfectly, there are three things you can do. Broadly, you can control demand, you can improve efficiency, or you can reduce uh, greenhouse gas intensity. Um, and to the extent that you don't do one of them, you have to do more of the others. And I think that is really the challenge. We, we, we know that we can make vehicles more efficient. We, have, we can have a discussion about how rapidly and how much it costs. We know we can decarbonize fuel to a degree. Um, again, that depends on the technology. We can, we can discuss how rapidly and how, how quickly. And we can also affect demand. And that's a political question, whether there's the will to do that. And there needs to be this debate. There needs to be uh, 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 an honest, open debate about how we actually need to, to affect uh, those, those three different parameters. And I think in tackling these, we also need to be very conscious that there are trade-offs, um, there are unforeseen consequences, um, and of course, you also have to bear in mind that some of these things have marginal effects that are not the same as the average effects. So, I mean, uh, the last speaker mentioned urban areas, but let me be provocative, because we are asked um, what car we drive. Well, I don't have a car. I, uh, I am a member of a car share scheme, I ride a bike and I use public transport. I live in a city and I would argue you don't need a car. And I think this is an important point to bear in mind. Um, urban areas in the EU are responsible for something like 40% of our transport greenhouse gas emissions. Do you really need them to be responsible for such a large proportion? And, and there is a political question that, that, uh, that needs to be reflected. Of course, um, there, will, there will still remain some cars. I'm not arguing that there don't need to be cars, but the degree that you can affect demand through different framework measures, uh, the, the degree less that you need to work on improving energy efficiency. Um, perhaps I can also say in response to the previous question, because we were asked if we know of a politician who, um, who drives a fuel efficient car. Well, yes, we do. Uh, the European Environment Commissioner, Mr. Dimas, drives a hybrid car. Um, so I think uh, there, is a, there is a clear example of a politician who actually does what he uh, practices, what he preaches. Um, the, I mean, I don't want to go into a, a long defense of the, of the Commission's proposal on, on energy efficiency for cars, but there we have a regulation that attempts to balance a number of different issues. Of course, there are issues about the competitiveness of industry, sending the right incentives, uh, and so on. And I mean, in the Commission's uh, deliberations, we, see, we did consider whether a weight-based approach was right or whether it should be based on footprint or something else. In the end, we concluded that a weight-based approach, although it had risks, those risks were minimal if the slope of the curve was sufficiently low. And we believe that the, uh, the, the level of the curve that has been proposed really avoids the, the serious risks of a, of a weight-based um, weight approach. I think perhaps that's enough for now. I'm sure others will want to say so. They're happy to come back later. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think uh, one of the advantages about uh, being employed by the Commission is you don't have to be elected because I think uh, in the UK, our Chancellor woke up yesterday 
to headlines that in the newspapers that said the road tax rebellion about his, uh, about his uh, new, new increases in vehicle excise duty for higher emitting vehicles. So uh, the challenges for politicians are, uh, uh, I think, uh, particularly sensitive ones. I'm going to ask um, three, of, uh, three of our speakers to, uh, to tell me what, uh, what uh, public policy initiative they think will make the most difference in reducing CO2. And I'm not going to tell them which three I'm going to ask. Uh, and while they're thinking about that, make them all a bit nervous, uh, I shall ask for two final contributions from the audience if there are two more messages that uh, the audience would like to give to our policymakers. Oh, there's one, a burning message here. <laughs> Simon Webb from the UK Department of Transport and I'm Director General of Transportation for Environment, among other things. Um, I'd just like to reinforce a point of Patrick Oliver about um, evidence for policy making, uh, excuse me, throwing this back at the academic community, but um, one of the gaps that we've been trying to fill is to find out what people actually use their cars for and how far they go in them. And we haven't quality assured this, so I haven't brought a slide yet. But in the UK, working off travel diaries and so on, we've come up with a fascinating curve which shows that the bulk of carbon, as opposed to the number of journeys, the bulk of carbon from cars comes from journeys in the range 20 kilometres to 60 kilometres. It is not the local journeys. Those are more numerous, but they're very short distance. And the principal activities in the 20 kilometre to 60 kilometre range are, first of all, commuting, second of all, private business, including shopping, and third, keeping in touch with your families and friends. So I, too, don't have a car. I belong to a car club, too. But most people go to work using a car journey, uh, in, in, uh, and many of these routes are not substitutable for public transport. So all I would just like to ask other countries to be interested in joining the, the quest for what do we actually use cars for would seem to be a good evidential base on which to start into the policy making. Second thing is just to say to this group, don't uh, please, you know, let's not offload all the difficult issues onto ministers. <laughs> um, if, when you run up with something, you say this could be tough with the consumers, therefore let's get ministers to be brave, you know. <laughs> um, as Judith just pointed out, that's not, you know, that's not helpful to them. What is helpful to them is to say, here are ways of meeting people's aspirations, and I've just talked about some of those, in ways which are very low carbon. So, Judith, the work you did, for example, to show you can have all sorts of vehicles at a very low carbon range, and things which are helpful to consumers and go to what we discern to be consumer interests seems to me a good policy-making route rather than just, you know, yelling at ministers to be tough on them. Thank you. So you're not coming up with the controversial suggestion that they should ban visits to family and friends in uh, order to reduce CO2, I'm glad to hear. Right, thank you for that. I'm now going to ask Stefan what his number one policy would be. I saw you writing something down, so I think you're prepared. You're something else, but <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, I think we, we prefer the regulatory, regulatory approach, definitely. But we should also not underestimate the, the power of especially CO2 taxation. What we saw since, for example, Denmark has introduced a CO2-based taxation, customers change their mind. They buy smaller vehicles, so policy does have an impact. And bringing it also more down to earth, I think there is not a big global solution, but everyone has to start by, by themselves. And it's a, also about public procurement. And it's about the, the small things. Like, for, I don't say, I drive a car, but you can guess which one. Um, but as, as a company, Toyota, we said, we, in order to be credible, we introduced a company car policy that we as a company meet 140 gram standard. And this was quite tough to discuss, as you can imagine, the fleet business is, company fleet business is not usually the business where you have all the low CO2 vehicles. But this is, I think, where we need to start in order to be credible. We need to take the first step. Thank you very much for that, Stefan. I'm going to ask Joss for the next... Uh it would be too easy to say tough uh, fuel efficiency standards, so I come up with another one. <laughs> I would be very happy if uh, uh, 
all the countries in the world, or at least let's start in Europe, would adopt something similar to the UK's uh, company car tax code. Huh? Um, company cars uh, in many, the biggest European markets, constitute some 60% of uh, sales, are sold to non-private people, and it's the high carbon cars that end up there. They are the, our future fleet, and there's really very, very weak incentives in that market to cut down on carbon. Um, the UK's policy has, to a very big extent, solved that, and uh, it would be very helpful if the other big markets would follow. Thank you for that, Joss. And since Patrick has led this final session for us, Patrick, what would be your uh, top policy? I already mentioned four. I simply would like to stress, yes, we need to take uh, some decisions altogether, ministers and uh, industry and uh, civil society. Let's make sure anyway that we, we build on two things. Uh, competition of technologies and solutions. It's important. It's very important. Okay? Don't, don't regulate on any given. Let's go for the objectives with the strategic vision. First of all, that's very important. And please, don't, don't reduce the freedom of movement of people. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I can see Vincent wants to, to say something, but I'm afraid I'm going to stop it there because we really have come to the end of our time. I think actually we have ended on a, a very positive note. Uh, and I think, in general, there has, I think, been a feeling that major changes in, uh, in, in certainly personal, in, in cars, um, are not unaffordable going forward, which is not entirely in line with what some of the, uh, the uh, predictions from the economists tell us. So I think this is an area where we, we still need uh, more data, but I think we've had a, a, a pretty optimistic view although we've had some, some very different views on, on timescales and, and doability, and I think John has made very good points about the need for, for uh, a higher level of modeling in, in some of these areas. So I'd just like to ask, uh, ask Kurt to make some announcements about, I think, some open fora where we can be continuing the debate in some of these important areas. So we hand over to Kurt. Yes, uh, so just mentioning to you two events, two open forums that may be of interest to you and which start at quarter past one, so soon. Uh, there are two open forums. One is on climate change and transport. Uh, climate change and transport, this is very much research oriented. So there uh, you will find people talking about recent research on relations between tra transport and climate change and how policy can, can uh, connect those issues. Um, so very fresh research uh, insights. That open forum is in Hall 5. That's a different building. Uh, the second open forum, uh, the title is The Future of Energy Supplies. In other words, this is about peak oil, but not just peak oil, also peak gas, peak coal, and uh, peak hydrocarbon, probably. Uh, the main people there Practically everyone there, the speakers will be from Uppsala University. So Kjell Aleklet has done a lot of work on these issues. And uh, while well, you can join that forum if you want to know about uh, future constraints on um, energy supplies. Um, that's basically what I should mention in terms of events that start in 10 or 15 minutes. Apart from that, I would like to thank all the participants and uh, speakers for their uh, very interesting inputs into this debate. Um, I think we've moved on a little bit and, yes, ended on a positive note uh, saying that uh, cutting carbon in, in road transport is actually possible and it can be done if, if the right policies are put in place soon. Um, so that's a positive note. Um, I would also like to thank at this point Julia King for managing this uh, difficult panel uh, very effectively and uh, thanking her for her inputs. Thank you. I think we should certainly thank all our speakers and our contributors from the floor. So thank you very much, everybody. And I think as a final note, uh, the, uh, our, a summary of the session will be on the website tomorrow and will be as an, used as an input for, for discussions tomorrow and on the, the final day of the meeting. Thank you.